Good morning to you. I'm Cathy Rochford. It's six o'clock on Tuesday, December the 5th, and you're watching Good Morning Britain from TVAM. At the top news story, Tory MPs vote today on Sir Anthony Meyer's challenge to Mrs Thatcher's leadership. It's the first challenge she's faced in her 14 years as party leader. Sport and Daley Thompson has withdrawn from next month's Commonwealth Games in New Zealand. The weather, fog and frost giving way in some places to sunny spells, though it will be cloudy in eastern England and there'll be drizzle in the far north of Scotland. Well, now for the first national and international news of the day. Let's go over to Paul Newman. Good morning, Paul. Good morning, Cathy. Hello. The news from TVAM on Tuesday, the 5th of December. Today, Mrs Thatcher faces the first challenge to her leadership of the Conservative Party for 14 years, although she's expected to survive. But what concerns the Prime Minister's senior supporters is that her authority may be damaged if too many MPs abstain from voting. Here's our chief political correspondent, Jerry Foley. In theory, this could be Mrs Thatcher's last day at number 10, but realistically, no one is expecting that to happen, least of all her challenger, Sir Anthony Mayer. Although fundamentally opposed to the Prime Minister's policies on Europe and other key issues like the poll tax, the North Cleared MP insists his only objective is to give Tory MPs their first opportunity in 14 years to vote on Mrs Thatcher's leadership. It's not going to compare the Prime Minister with me. What they're going to say is, do we want the Prime Minister or don't we want the Prime Minister? That's the only question they're going to be answering. 374 Conservative MPs can vote in the ballot, which will take place in this committee room in Westminster. One late uncertainty is the number of MPs who might miss the vote through being abroad or ill. But Mr Thatcher's campaign manager and former Defence Secretary is pulling out all the stops. And my task over these last few days has been to try and reduce those to, to very few. There are a few who will certainly uh, not vote for Mrs Thatcher and I accept that. But um, of the rest, uh, there are people who I think um, are moving in the right direction. The result of the ballot should be known by 7 o'clock this evening when the size of the vote against the Prime Minister, including any abstentions, will be studied in detail for clues as to Mrs Thatcher's long-term position. After this, her first leadership challenge. Jerry Foley, TVM News, Westminster. President Bush has arrived back in Washington after assuring his NATO allies that American troops will stay in Europe for as long as they're needed. He arrived by helicopter at the White House earlier this morning. Before leaving Brussels, Mr Bush called for a more integrated Europe, which is at odds with Mrs Thatcher's current stance against closer economic union. Our political reporter, Maya Even, was at the briefing. For George Bush, surrounded by his NATO allies, the accord achieved at this meeting crowned a weekend of successful summitry. He promised that a significant number of American forces would stay in Europe, and the allies backed his plan to conclude existing arms talks before considering more drastic cuts. But the question of European integration proved thornier. When asked, Mr. Bush urged cooperation. What we're trying to do in the West, and, and I think the EC is trying to do it also, is to assist those countries that are moving down the, down the democratic path. A controversial reference, too, about the EC. It's my belief that the events of our times call both for a continued, perhaps even intensified effort of the 12 to integrate but Mrs. Thatcher wasn't happy about this. He hoped for the close integration of Europe. That doesn't give us in Britain any difficulty. Our problem is not the closer cooperation or integration, but what kind of Europe we wish to see. It's this controversial issue of integration which Europe's leaders will return to at this weekend's EC summit in Strasbourg. Maya Even, TVAM News, at NATO headquarters in Brussels. Mikhail Gorbachev has made the dramatic admission that the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia 21 years ago was a mistake. Meanwhile, in Prague, a new government is expected to be announced today following talks between opposition groups and senior party officials. Andrew Wilson reports. At his briefing of Warsaw Pact leaders, Mr Gorbachev's message to the world was clear. The Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia was illegal and a mistake. This closes a chapter of history that began late on August the 20th, 1968, when the Kremlin sent tanks into the streets of Prague to put an end to Alexander Dubček's liberal ideals. Protest leaders were arrested and Dubček ousted from power. 21 years later, he's once again a figurehead for reform. In his first interview on Western television since the invasion, Dubček reiterated his old ideals. We were suppressed by external force. The basic idea is the same now. 
You cannot suppress an idea. An idea is going to survive within people's conscience. Later today, with the formation of a new government, including members of the reformist group Civic Forum, Czechoslovakia will take another step away from communist domination. In East Germany, meanwhile, there have been more protests in a wave of public outrage over the corruption of communist officials. In Leipzig, over 200,000 demonstrators applauded speakers calling for German reunification as crowds marched on the secret police headquarters. West German flags were waved alongside placards demanding unity and freedom. Well, finally, Sir Harry Livermore, the Liverpool lawyer involved in the legal aftermath of the Heysel and Hillsborough disasters, has died aged 81. Sir Harry, a former Lord Mayor of the city, defended several fans charged with manslaughter after the Heysel tragedy. After Hillsborough, he campaigned on behalf of the bereaved and injured. That is the latest news at six and a half minutes past six. And back to Cathy. Paul, thank you very much. Sad news, wasn't it, about Sir Harry Livermore? He's a great character. Now, thankfully, the uh, fog seems to have disappeared, at least from the London area. Well, Ulrika is with us uh, for the first weather news of the morning. Good morning to you, Ulrika. Good morning. Is that right? Is that the case for the rest of the country? Well, it doesn't seem to be quite as widespread, but we're still under the influence of a high pressure and clear skies, fairly clear skies. So that unfortunately means fog in a lot of places, but I think... Uh, Southern Scotland's probably the worst, but um, if you, we have a look at this weather, we're still at high pressure over most of Britain, so for most of Scotland and Northern Ireland it should be a bright start. The extreme eastern parts of Scotland may be rather cloudy though. Fog patches are still affecting parts of Britain as we said, particularly southern Scotland where there's some frost too. For England and Wales it's a mixed morning with Wales and the South West and the West Midlands enjoying some sunny spells. For the rest of England, it'll be cloudy with some light drizzle along the eastern coast. And this afternoon, while it's more or less an east-west divide over Britain this afternoon, the western half stretching as far inland as the East Midlands should have a mainly dry afternoon with some bright spells. Still some fog patches hanging around in the borders of Scotland, though. Quite a range in temperatures as well, only around 4 Celsius, that's 39 Fahrenheit up there in Scotland, but up to 10 Celsius, that's 50 Fahrenheit in the southwest of England. A lot colder in the fog, of course, but uh, eastern parts of both Scotland and England will be rather cloudy with some light coastal drizzle. Temperatures there similar throughout, around 8 Celsius, that's 46 Fahrenheit. And this evening, Scotland, Northern Ireland and the northwest of England will have a clear night, and this will, of course, lead to fog patches and very low temperatures. For the rest of England and Wales, a cloudy and misty night is in store, although it will be a little clearer in, the sou in southern parts of Wales and the southwest of England. And the outlook, well, overnight fog and frost still on the way with similar weather to today. Ulrika, yeah. thank you very much indeed for that. And uh, Ulrika will be back in just under half an hour, is that right, Ulrika? Yes. You will, of course, great. Now, look at this morning's sport, and we start with athletics. And uh, Daly Thompson is out of the England team for next month's Commonwealth Games in New Zealand. Thompson, who was bidding for a record fourth Commonwealth decathlon title, says he is not ready for competition, although he's back in full training after a knee operation. Soccer and the offside law may be changed in an effort to improve the game. Football's world governing body, FIFA, says the new law could be introduced after next year's World Cup in Italy. Well, the change would allow an attacker to receive the ball when he's level with the opposition's last defender without being offside. Well, Steve Bull of Wolves has been named in the England squad for next week's friendly against Yugoslavia at Wembley. Bull, who missed the chance of playing in last month's match against Italy because of suspension, could partner Aston Villa's David Platt in a new-look attack. Arsenal's Michael Thomas, Tony Dorigo of Chelsea and QPR's Paul Parker are also named in the squad after playing in the B International last month. But Arsenal's Tony Adams and Tottenham's Paul Gascoigne are not included in the senior squad. They will play in the B International against Yugoslavia at Millwall next Tuesday. The Rangers manager Graham Souness has been reported by police to the Scottish FA and could face disciplinary measures. He was allegedly involved in a post-match incident with a Hearts player last Saturday. Racing now, and there are meetings today at Leicester and Fontwell. And the going news, it's good to firm over the hurdles at Leicester and firm over the chases. And good to firm on all stretches at Fontwell. Uh, Jeff Stelling, he goes for Belldale Star in the 145 at Fontwell. That's Belldale Star in the 145 at Fontwell. 
at the dogs, Mike Palmer chooses an old favourite of his, Born Door Express out of Trap 1 in the 8.45 at Wimbledon. That's Born Door Express in the 8.45 at Wimbledon. Time now is 10 minutes past six. You're watching Good Morning Britain. And now time to keep you informed about what's at the top in the world of entertainment. And today it's the top five paperbacks as compiled for us by uh, Book Trust Limited. And there is a surprise re-entry at number one this week. Uh, in reverse order, they are at five. Silver Wedding by Maeve Binchy. At four, The Charmed Circle, Catherine Gaskin. Three, Word Sisters, Terry Pratchett. At two, Bill Bailey's Daughter by Catherine Cookson. And the King of Horror, Stephen King, goes straight back into the chart at number one with the Tommy Knockers there by Stephen King. Time for a look at this morning's newspapers and uh, what stories they're choosing to lead on. Most of them, not surprisingly, President Bush's address to NATO leaders in Brussels yesterday. That makes the lead story in uh, most of the heavyweight papers. There we are, front page of the Times there. Bush pledges US will stay in Europe. The European community has a vital role to play in the peaceful revolution that's taking place in Eastern Europe, according to President Bush. It's the same story also in The Independent. Bush tells the European community to spearhead a united Europe. And there's the same sort of picture that President Bush and Mrs. Thatcher there uh, together. Uh, Daily Mail chooses to lead on um, the Chancellor John Major's remarks made yesterday to um, a Treasury um, All-Party Select MPs committee when he was talking yesterday, in which um, he says that uh, there, were uh, there were mistakes made in government policy, monetary policies, and uh, there you have the front page of the Daily Mail. Lawson did get it wrong official. That's how the Daily Mail sees it anyway. Um, quite a, a worrying story on the front page of the Daily Express um, under the headline, Micro Cookers Warning. According to the paper, two and a half million microwaves in Britain's kitchens are potentially faulty. Quite a worrying story, that one. Finally, uh, some nice pictures in most of the papers today. Um, here we are, uh, back page of the Daily Telegraph here. Stable Yard reveals a fortune on wheels. Well, apparently an estate agent went along to value an orchard that was going to be sold for development and found a, a massive collection of vintage cars, 30 vintage cars worth up to £200,000, uh, lined up in the two stable blocks in Taunton in Somerset, where among other cars, an early Model T Ford, a 1915 Calthorpe with a folding roof, and a 1920s Austin 7. Marvellous find there. And um, we'll be reporting on more classic cars right after this break. From the makers of Andrews comes an effective answer to that morning after feeling. Andrews' answer. It quickly undoes what you overdid. Hello. Today, be prepared for considerable <coughs> downpours, followed by <coughs> high winds. There's nothing worse than getting through the day with a cold, but Contact 400 gives fast, effective relief from the symptoms of a cold for up to 12 hours. As you can see, things have cleared up now. Well, when I say cleared up, I mean cleared up here, not cleared up here. Until there's a cure, there's contact. Welcome back to the morning programme. Uh, the top news story this morning, Tory MPs vote today on Sir Anthony Meyer's challenge to Mrs Thatcher's leadership. It's the first challenge she's faced in her 14 years as party leader. Sport and Daley Thompson has withdrawn from next month's Commonwealth Games in New Zealand. The weather, fog and frost giving way in some places to sunny spells, though it will be cloudy in eastern England. Now, uh, a lot of people have become wary of investing in the stock market since the Black Monday crash two years ago. Uh, but if you want to do something more exciting with your money than leaving it in the bank or the building society, maybe you should consider buying a classic car. Uh, some of the rarest cars in the world are up for auction in London today, as Marion Lowe now reports. These are second-hand cars with a difference, and not just because they cost anything from £7,000 to £700,000 each. For they are some of the rarest cars in the world. This 1968 Ferrari is one of only 23 ever made. And it's not just dedicated collectors that will be taking part in the bidding. With some of the cars appreciating by two to three hundred percent a year, 
They can represent a better investment than stocks and shares, and you certainly have more fun for your money. Marvellous, those cars, aren't they? That report compiled by Marion Lowe. And for those of you who can't quite afford a classic car, you've still got just enough time to invest in a more liquid asset. Today is the last chance for those of you thinking of applying for water shares. Now, will the sale be a success? Well, with us we have our financial correspondent, Peter Coey. Peter, good morning to you. Morning, Kathy. I think all the signs are it is going to be a success. That's quite unusual, isn't it? Because the signs a couple of months back, but it was a very unpopular flotation. Well, it's odd with this one, because that's right. I mean, even until quite recently, the polls were showing on the separate issue of whether the public in general approved of the water sale. The verdict was that more than 80% of the British public thought it was wrong to privatise water. But that still seems to leave room for an awful lot of people to show an interest in the flotation itself. And when it comes to the question of whether you're going to put your money behind it, that's a different issue for many people. And they may disapprove to the pollsters of the actual flotation, but on the decision of investing their money, increasingly, they're going to go for it. That's the only reason that you can see. It's basically people are seeing a, a chance of making a bit of money that's in right. the short term. That, well, I, I think there are some people who think there is a short-term profit to make. Uh, there have been a quarter of a million applications by, the, by this weekend and uh, if it's anything like previous flotations then that only represents the tip of the iceberg. It's about a tenth of the number of people who will finally apply. So in the, today and tomorrow you can expect hundreds of thousands of applications, I suspect. Because the stock market is very buoyant, uh, it, there's been a rally in general share prices since the price of the water shares was announced at £2.40 uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and so that £2.40 price, which the government set generously then to make shares look cheap, looks even cheaper now. So for people going for short-term profit, when dealing starts on December the 12th, the chances of making that profit, of realising it, when they're actually able to sell, are even greater. So long, of course, as share prices don't collapse in the meantime. That's, that's a, a, a small but considerable risk. Well, for anyone who didn't register an interest initially, I mean, is today too late for most people who fancy having a, to, a flutter? It's not too late today, no. There's plenty of opportunity to apply on a public application form. If you haven't registered already, then you can't apply on one of the priority application forms, which qualifies you for certain incentives in your local water authority, like uh, a loyalty bonus or a discount uh, on the later instalments on the full share price. Uh, but you can apply today on a public application form which is available from banks and post offices, also in all the national newspapers. And if you can get it to a branch of uh, Lloyd's or NatWest in England and Wales today, or the Royal Bank of Scotland in Scotland, the, uh, bigger part of the Bank of Scotland, or Ulster Bank in Northern Ireland by 3 o'clock this afternoon, then you will be eligible um, for the allocation of shares. Now, you mentioned that obviously there is a risk with this sort of investment. I mean, how great is that risk for the ordinary investor? Well, in the short term, I think the risk is quite small because, in general, I mean, it's going to take quite a shock to the system, which is going to be nothing like the shock that we saw in 1987 when the BP flotation was destroyed, really, uh, by the world stock market crash. Well, we're not in, the, in similar con trading conditions now. There isn't really scope for a crash on that scale. Um, but there could be shocks to the system, and it could be that uh, the premium of 25 to 30 pence which uh, the professionals in the market now are quoting for the premium that you will make uh, on top of your £1 part paid uh, shares when dealing starts. And it could be that that 
uh, that premium would be reduced by poor conditions. But the chances of making a loss in the short term are fairly minimal at the moment. In the long term, of course, the risk, if you want to hold on to the shares, is that other things can happen, particularly that Labour, if they got back into power, might decide to re-nationalise water uh, at, at unfavourable terms. Uh, just briefly, the Rover Group, the sale of the Rover Group, uh, what's been the reaction in the city to or the Labour's attacks and all the disclosures there? Well, I think, I think the, the city are, are fairly uh, comfortable about the whole situation. I mean, from their point of view, it, it's, that their only worry is that the government might be unsettled by the revelation by the senior civil servant in the Department of Trade that there was a cover-up. It was an extraordinary admission by him, really. If he'd been a politician and not a civil servant, he might have found some other way of saying there'd been a cover-up. But he said it in exactly those words. Um, and uh, it could be of an embarrassment to the government, which in turn the city would not be happy about. Well, Peter Kelly, our financial correspondent, thank you very much. In incidentally, are you investing in water shares? I shall be, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sound advice from Peter there. It is time now for um, uh, Britain's favourite stargazer, Russell Grant. If it's your birthday today, you share it with singer Little Richard, who's 54, and American golfer Lanny Watkins, who's 40. Now, here is Russell. Hiya, gang. Sagittarius, shower your beloved with tokens of your undying love. You can start by covering them with kisses from top to toe. And where do you go from there? Well, that's up to you. Capricorn, two heads are so much better than one now. So if you've a problem or dilemma, get some sage advice from someone expert, trusted or close. Aquarius, nothing is for nothing in this world. But if you're prepared to put your energy into a project, then the rewards will be tumultuous work. Pisces. You need an injection of excitement into your world to start beefing up your social diary and filling in some of those empty spaces. Aries, if you sit on the fence, then you could fall off. It's in your best interest to be decisive and incisive now, rather than dilly-dally. Taurus, as the festive season starts to swing, so perhaps a trip to the shops or market is called for, if only to buy cards or stocking fillers. Gemini, now it's up to you, but if you make sacrifices now, then the long-term gains will be worth the sweat of your brow now. Cancer, don't leave your Christmas preparations until the last minute. Start sorting out your agenda for pleasure now. Oh, how's that larder of yours? Packed? Leo, you're at one with the world and peace with yourself right now. So use this new inner harmony to make your life stable, safe, and secure. Virgo, seasonal shindigs and soirees are worth their weight in gold, as it'll put you in touch with influential folk or well-informed people. Libra, don't carry the weight of the world on your delicate shoulders. Discuss any difficulties with a loved one. You'll be sustained by their support and encouragement. Scorpio, whether you jump open-armed into an amorous adventure or make a tactical withdrawal, well, that depends just how much you want to commit yourself to someone. Well, ta-ra. Well, thank you, Russell. Time for the regular dock spot now, and as we head towards the depths of winter, should we all be pestering our doctors for flu jabs? Well, joining us now with her view is Dr. Caroline Dickinson. Caroline, good morning to you. Good morning. First of all, can we just differentiate between a cold and the flu? I think a lot of people get mixed up about that. Well, what a, what a cold is, is just the, the symptoms in your nose and your throat, basically. Blocked nose, runny nose, sore throat, sneezing, bit of coughing as well, especially at the end of it. Whereas what we think of as flu is more being really laid out with a high temperature, aching all over your body, really not able to get out of bed. I mean, most people can go on going to work with, flu, with, with a cold, but not with flu. But having said that, some people, when faced with the flu virus, won't get the bad symptoms, will only get a bit of a, a sore throat, say, and some people will have to go to bed. So it does depend. It's not just on what's infecting you that's important. It's also your response to it. 
that's so, important. So what's your advice to people? Should they go off every winter and have a, a jab against flu or not? Is it not necessary for some people? Well, what we're trying to do is target the people that really need the flu vaccination because fit, healthy adults don't really need it. They might be ill for a few days, but they're not, not going to succumb to it. There are some groups of people that it's really worth giving it to, and that's people who have chronic chest diseases, anything like chronic bronchitis or emphysema or asthma, people with heart problems, it's also worth giving it to, people who are diabetic and therefore have a low resistance to infection, and some other of the diseases that lower your resistance to infection. People with chronic kidney disease, it's also worth giving it to, and there are a few other sort of small print ones, but it's basically people who wouldn't be able to cope so well if they got a bad infection and might get some secondary infection as well as the flu like for instance <coughs> excuse me they start off with flu and then go on and get pneumonia after that because the chest is already in a bad shape the vaccine is quite popular in other countries isn't it in mm. france i think there's so mm. many people every year go for it do you find that different i mean does it affect different nationalities i don't think no not the flu itself i mean it obviously affects all sorts of people in all sorts of countries. It's not more prevalent in France particularly, but I, I don't know what it is about France. Maybe they prefer having injections in France. I don't know. I think people in this country are reluctant to have injections unless they, they really need them. And I mean, th there is there is a certain amount, I mean, there's only a, a certain amount of flu vaccine available, and it's not good for lots of fit, healthy young adults to be having it at the expense of the elderly, say, who are a group that we try and, try and target. Are there different strains of flu? Well, that's the, 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 the problem with flu, is it's flu isn't one virus like, say, the measles virus that you get a vaccine to, and that's the end of the story. The flu virus is always changing. It's always trying to thwart us by changing a little bit so that it can reinfect you. So that's, that's one of the reasons why they keep on having to bring out new viruses. And the other reason is that a, a, a vaccination will only last you a year. Even if it's the same flu coming around the following year, your immunity may have gone away to it. So There's actually a, a story in the newspapers mm. today about, uh, I don't know if you can see it here in the Daily Telegraph, um, English flu apparently affecting 50% of pupils in the southwest of England. It says that schools in Gloucestershire, Bristol and Western Supermare are reporting absenteeism of up to 50%. Is that mm. unusual? I mean, it sounds terrible. It's pretty unusual, that. I mean, it, there obviously is um, epidemics, perhaps too alarmist to work, but there is an awful lot of flu about at the moment. And where I work in London, I've seen an enormous number of people, and we're just vi out visiting people with flu all the time. And in the great majority of cases, there's not a lot that you can do about it, except to say to somebody, stay in bed, don't try and work through it, take aspirin or paracetamol to keep your temperature down, drink plenty of fluids because you lose a lot of fluids through having the high temperature, and be patient because it might take a week for you to feel better. People want to say, oh, well, just give me an antibiotic and I'll be, I'll be up tomorrow, but it's not like that. You have to let it take its course. But finally, what can people do to avoid getting flu in the first place? Well, I mean, that, that's difficult. You can't always avoid getting flu, but stay, stay as healthy as you can, eat well, sleep well, and take exercise, do all the right things, don't smoke, and you're, you're, you're liable to, if you get it, you won't get it as badly. Caroline Dickinson, thanks very much for talking to us about flu. Thank you. Time to find out about the weather. Here's Ulrika. Thanks, Catherine, and uh, good morning to you. Well, we're still under the influence of a high pressure, which is quite good news for some of us, and uh, not such good news for the people in the eastern parts of both England and Scotland this morning. But for most of Scotland, in fact, and Northern Ireland, quite a bright start there. A little bit of fog still affecting parts of Britain, particularly in the southern parts of Scotland and along in the borders there. Quite a foggy start and quite chilly too. There will be some frost there as well. In the extreme eastern parts of Scotland, a rather cloudy start. And as you can see, for most of England, in fact, quite a cloudy start to the day as well. But that cloud protecting us from a little bit of fog and keeping the temperatures up. So it's not all bad news. Now, for most of Wales and the southwest of England, a fairly bright start to the day. There should be some sunny spells. And as we move into the afternoon, well, more or less an east-west divide as far as the weather's concerned. As you can see, quite sunny in most western parts of Britain. And temperatures, there's a great range in temperatures. In fact, only 4 Celsius up there in the north of Scotland. That's 39 Fahrenheit, up to 10 down here in the south. But along the eastern side of both England and Scotland, not nice at all. But temperatures, not bad. Cathy. 
Ulrika, thank you. Still to come, our regular look back at yesterday's proceedings in Parliament and our political editor, Jerry Foley, will be here to talk about today's vote for the leader of the Tory party. Right now, it's half past six. Time for latest news from Paul Newman. Good morning. Today, Mrs Thatcher faces the first challenge to her leadership of the Conservative Party for 14 years. Although she is expected to win comfortably, the Prime Minister's supporters are concerned that her authority may be damaged if too many MPs abstain from voting. Here's our chief political correspondent, Jerry Foley. In theory, this could be Mrs Thatcher's last day at number 10, but realistically, no one is expecting that to happen, least of all her challenger, Sir Anthony Mayer. Although fundamentally opposed to the Prime Minister's policies on Europe and other key issues like the poll tax, the North Cleared MP insists his only objective is to give Tory MPs their first opportunity in 14 years to vote on Mrs Thatcher's leadership. It's not going to compare the Prime Minister with me. What they're going to say is, do we want the Prime Minister or don't we want the Prime Minister? That's the only question they're going to be answering. 374 Conservative MPs can vote in the ballot, which will take place in this committee room in Westminster. One late uncertainty is the number of MPs who might miss the vote through being abroad or ill. But Mr Thatcher's campaign manager and former Defence Secretary is pulling out all the stops. And my task over these last few days has been to try and reduce those to, to very few. There are a few who will certainly uh, not vote for Mrs Thatcher and I accept that. But um, of the rest, uh, there are people who I think um, are moving in the right direction. The result of the ballot should be known by 7 o'clock this evening when the size of the vote against the Prime Minister, including any abstentions, will be studied in detail for clues as to Mrs Thatcher's long-term position after this, her first leadership challenge. Jerry Foley, TVM News, Westminster. President Bush has arrived back in Washington after assuring his NATO allies that American troops will stay in Europe for as long as they're needed. He arrived by helicopter at the White House earlier this morning. Before leaving Brussels, Mr Bush called for a more integrated Europe, which is at odds with Mrs Thatcher's current stance against closer economic union. Our political reporter, Maya Even, was at the briefing. For George Bush, surrounded by his NATO allies, the accord achieved at this meeting crowned a weekend of successful summitry. He promised that a significant number of American forces would stay in Europe, and the allies backed his plan to conclude existing arms talks before considering more drastic cuts. But the question of European integration proved thornier. When asked, Mr. Bush urged cooperation. What we're trying to do in the West, and, and I think the EC is trying to do it also, is to assist those countries that are moving down the, down the democratic path. A controversial reference, too, about the EC. It's my belief that the events of our times call both for a continued, perhaps even intensified effort of the 12 to integrate but Mrs. Thatcher wasn't happy about this. He hoped for the close integration of Europe. That doesn't give us in Britain any difficulty. Our problem is not the closer cooperation or integration, but what kind of Europe we wish to see. It's this controversial issue of integration which Europe's leaders will return to at this weekend's EC summit in Strasbourg. Maya Even, TVAM News, at NATO headquarters in Brussels. Mikhail Gorbachev has made the dramatic admission that the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia 21 years ago was a mistake. Meanwhile, in Prague, a new government is expected to be announced today, following talks between opposition groups and senior party officials. Andrew Wilson reports. At his briefing of Warsaw Pact leaders, Mr Gorbachev's message to the world was clear. The Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia was illegal and a mistake. This closes a chapter of history that began late on August the 20th, 1968, when the Kremlin sent tanks into the streets of Prague to put an end to Alexander Dubček's liberal ideals. Protest leaders were arrested and Dubček ousted from power. 21 years later, he's once again a figurehead for reform. In his first interview on Western television since the invasion, Dubček reiterated his old ideals. We were suppressed by external force. The basic idea is the same now. You cannot suppress an idea. An idea is going to survive within people's conscience. Later today, with the formation of a new government, including members of the reformist group Civic Forum, Czechoslovakia will take another step away from communist domination. In East Germany, meanwhile, there have been more protests in a wave of public outrage over the corruption of communist officials. In Leipzig, over 200,000 demonstrators applauded speakers calling for German reunification as crowds marched on the secret police headquarters. West German flags were waved alongside placards demanding unity and freedom. 
Sir Harry Livermore, the Liverpool lawyer involved in the legal aftermath of the Heysel and Hillsborough disasters, has died aged 81. Sir Harry, a former Lord Mayor of the city, defended several fans charged with manslaughter after the Heysel tragedy. And in the wake of Hillsborough, he campaigned on behalf of the bereaved and injured. On to the financial news now, and in London, the 100 share index closed down 8 points at 23.03. On Wall Street, the Dow Jones closed up 6 points at 27.54. In Tokyo, the Nikkei average has closed up 190 points at 37.494. On currencies, the dollar's up in the Far East overnight at 178.55 against the Deutsche Mark, 143.80 against the yen, at 156.75 against the pound. Sterling itself is down against the Deutsche Mark at 275.80. Gold is down at $401.50 an ounce, and the US long bond is up at 102.25. That's a yield of 7.88%. That is the latest news. It's coming up to 6.36. Here's Cathy. Paul, thank you. Today, the TVAM Caring Christmas Parcels Collection gets underway, and there are collection points at Boots for your parcels for the elderly. Well, gifts like non-perishable foodstuffs, warm clothing, and little luxury items are welcome. If you have a look here, there's a, just a little example of that. Um, these little perfumed posies here would be a, a, a lovely gift for an, an elderly person. Or what about just a little tin of biscuits or these little jams here? They're non-perishable and would be ideal something like that. Uh, and please label your parcels if you do decide to give so we know what's inside them. Um, the important part of this year's campaign, though, is not just to give a parcel, but to show the elderly that you care. Now, we've produced this book with some lovely stories about why children love their grandparents. It was actually compiled for us um, uh, by uh, Giles Brandreth. Uh, on Good Morning Britain, he actually put out the suggestion a, cu a couple of months ago, and this is the result. There's some, there's some lovely um, quotes in it from children. Uh, personally, I like the one from Emily Gray, who's 11, who says, I love my gran because she spoils me silly. Sounds like a good thing. <laughs> Another part of the Caring Christmas campaign is our Care for the Elderly booklet, and there are some really practical ideas in it for ways that you can show uh, that you care. Now, if you would like one of these booklets, we'll send a large self-addressed envelope with a 34-piece stamp uh, to Care for the Elderly Booklet, TVAM, PO Box 200, London, NW1, 8TQ. And if you've already helped with our campaign, then thank you very much. Now, 6.37 is the time you're watching Good Morning Britain. Later today, Mrs. Thatcher faces one of the most crucial tests of her 10 years at number 10 when she faces a challenge to her leadership from backbencher, backbencher Sir Anthony Meyer. There's no doubt she'll win, but it's by how much that counts. But with us is our political editor, Jerry Foley. Jerry, good morning to you. Good morning, Cathy. Um, just how damaging is this challenge to Mrs. Thatcher's leadership going to be, do you think? Well, that depends, of course, on how many people vote for Sir Anthony and how many people abstain from giving their vote and support to Mrs. Thatcher. But in general, I think we can say fairly safely that it is damaging. It's damaging because Mrs. Thatcher has had a very bad political year. She had a disastrous uh, European election campaign, and her attitude to Europe has become an important issue in this leadership campaign. She had a disastrous reshuffle in July. It was very badly handled. And then, of course, we got into the fiasco surrounding Nigel Lawson and his resignation. So the last thing she needs at present is another dose of uncertainty. So she won't be looking forward to today's challenge. Now, I know it's very difficult to talk about uh, numbers, but what would be a bad result for Mrs. Thatcher if we could gauge it in that way? Well, there are 374 MPs who can vote, including Mrs. Thatcher, of course. Now, the numbers game is something we've all been playing for the last couple of days or so. It's very difficult to predict. The first thing I, I think which we have to say, it, it is a secret ballot. And secondly, all the MPs and ministers have been playing their cards extremely close to their chest, so that's making it even more difficult to predict. But a couple of indicators have come out. Most people don't expect Sir Anthony to get more than maybe 20 or 30 votes for him. But the real question is how many people abstain? And if you like, we're looking at the question of positive abstentions, people who won't give their support to Mrs. Thatcher on this occasion. If she fails to get the support of more than 300 of her MPs, in other words, if more than 74 Conservative MPs either vote for Sir Anthony or abstain, that would be regarded as very damaging. If the figure comes out around 50, it would still be a blow, but not as bad as 74. The other point, of course, we should remember, if more than 50 MPs, Conservative MPs, vote for Sir Anthony or abstain from giving support to Mrs. Thatcher,
she has, of course, lost the support of the majority of MPs in the House of Commons itself, which in psychological terms could be damaging. But what about spoilt ballot papers? Are there likely to be any of those? And what would that indicate? Well, that's what makes it very difficult to predict. Yesterday, uh, George Younger, who's Mr. Sanchez's campaign manager, was talking about up to 40 Conservative MPs who might be out of the country at present and are desperately trying to contact them to make sure that they were able to register their proxy votes. But they seem to be laying the ground a little bit to say, you know, we can't be sure that we'll get everybody who's entitled to vote will be able to cast their ballot today. And if they don't, for valid reasons, are they lumped in with the abstentions? Because the general rule of thumb is abstentions would be counted as an anti-Thatcher vote. So it is quite a complicated uh, estimate, which is going to have to be done later tonight, but that's what makes it fun. How do you think, though, you say it's fun, how do you think that Mrs. Thatcher personally is taking this? Do you, do you think she's nervous about it? Well, she has gone on record as saying that she's always nervous when it comes to uh, election results, and she's taking nothing for granted. Everybody expects her to win, but the real importance of this election is how well does she win and what does it tell us about her chances of staying in power to lead the Conservatives into the next election and beyond. Equally, if she doesn't do terribly well, what does it tell us about her potential successes? People like Michael Hezatine or Geoffrey Howe, will the timing be right from their perspective? So there's a lot at stake here and there'll be a lot of analysis irrespective of what the result because it is crucial for the future of Mrs. Thatcher, for the Conservative Party and of course for the government itself. Well, Jerry Foley, our political editor, thank you very much. Incidentally, what time today can we expect a result? Voting st stops at six, a result shortly after half past six. Jerry, thank you very much indeed for that. Uh, coming up, uh, more news, more sport, and yesterday's proceedings in Parliament after this break. <laughs> Too much food and drink last night? Resolve, the all-in-one remedy for the morning after. We're in position now. Okay. Home at last. You need a shave. What about you? There's a new style of shaver now, which switches on just like this. Electronically controlled, it's designed to give you a perfect shave. The green light will tell you when it needs recharging. Then roll up the shutter to switch it off. The Grundig Rolltronic, a real reason for switching shavers. The best things in life cost a little more, but they're worth it. Like new Panache Evening Edition perfume by Lothric. Panache Evening Edition, a special expression of the classic Panache fragrance for those very special occasions. Panache by Lothric. Classic or new Evening Edition, the choice is yours. Three freshly made cups of coffee from three coffee makers. One is obviously hotter than the others. Why? Because one has a double insulated water system. And as you can see, it's from Philips. The Philips Cafe Royale for a really hot, tasty cup of coffee. So this is Christmas. Please make a donation. Call 0839 800 900 now. The Gladys Knight Singles Album, out now. Hello and welcome back. The top news story. Tory MPs vote today on Sir Anthony Meyer's challenge to Mrs Thatcher's leadership. It's the first challenge she's faced in her 14 years as party leader. The weather, fog and frost giving way in some places to sunny spells, though it will be cloudy in eastern England. Now for a look at this morning's sport, and we start with athletics. Daly Thompson has pulled out of the England team for next month's Commonwealth Games in New Zealand. Thompson says he's not ready for competition, although he's back in full training after an operation on a knee injury. Well, the offside law in soccer may be changed in an effort to improve the game. Football's world-governing body, FIFA, says the new law could be introduced after next year's World Cup finals in Italy. Steve Bull of Wolves has been named in the England squad for next week's friendly against Yugoslavia at Wembley. Bull could partner Aston Villa's David Platt in a new-look attack. Racing and there are meetings today at Leicester and Fontwell. Uh, the going news, it's good to firm over the hurdles at Leicester and firm over the chases there and good to firm on all stretches at Fontwell. 
Well, Jeff Stelling goes for Belldale Star in the 145 at Fontwell. That's Belldale Star in the 145 at Fontwell. At the Dogs, Mike Palmer chooses Born Door Express out of Trap 1 in the 845 at Wimbledon. That's Born Door Express in the 845 at Wimbledon. Now for our regular summary of yesterday's proceedings in Parliament and over to our political reporter, Sean Holden. Good morning, Cathy. The second reading of the coal bill saw strong opposition attempts to undermine government strategy towards an industry Labour's long claimed as its own. But first, at question time, Dennis Skinner couldn't resist digging a bit deeper into the Rover privatisation controversy. That the government are guilty of fraud, that they've probably been fiddling certain tax concessions and subsidies, and there should be one law in this country, one that applies to the government, as well as to that old lady in the supermarket that might get away with a tin of pilchards. The Attorney General, Sir Patrick Mayhew, said the government had nothing to add to statements by the Trade Secretary last week. And by the way, yelling questions didn't make them more persuasive. Growing evidence of a new famine in Ethiopia brought the Overseas Development Minister to the dispatch box. Our overriding priority is to get the food to the starving. To do this, we must first persuade the Ethiopian government to allow the passage of food across the lines. Second, we must work for an end to the conflicts in Ethiopia. Mrs Chalker denied Labour accusations the government was acting too late. The main business of the day was the coal industry bill under which the government will cancel debts of £5 billion. The bill will restructure an industry which has already vastly increased productivity, but at the cost of more than 100,000 jobs. And I, for one, would not want to play down the human consequences of these changes. But each pit that has closed has been subject to a detailed review procedure like that of no other industry. And each man who has left has done so voluntarily. British Coal has been able to offer alternative jobs to any man who wanted to remain in the industry. Labour MPs feel on home ground in debates about the coal industry. Many have mining backgrounds and don't usually feel the Tories get much right when it comes to coal. But Frank Dobson was prepared to make one concession before he burrowed into the government's motives. We welcome the decision to write off those debts. The government are doing the right thing, but they're doing the right thing for the wrong reason. Yeah, yeah. It's only being done as part one of the government's usual three-stage procedure for privatisation, which can be summarised as write off, sell off, and then rip off. Yeah. And that's what they intend. Alan Meal from a mining district wanted to make sure the Tories got the message. This bill is a disgrace. It is yet another rip-off by this government towards their friends in the city. In no way, shape or form is it good for the coal industry. From the Tory benches, Neil Hamilton was a gold mine of compliments for Energy Secretary John Wakeham. It's as if I say that uh, he has been the uh, most forward-looking and effective Minister for Coal, certainly since I've been in the House, and I pay tribute to the work which he has done. He was promptly ridiculed by Frank Haynes, who shed a miner's light onto the debate. He's a farmer's boy. He doesn't know anything about pit mining. He knows nothing about coal mining at all. You see, I'm in a position where I had 35 years underground before I came here. I went in, in the pit in 44 and came out in 79 to come to this marvellous place. But apparently Mr Haynes felt that change in career had brought in some less than marvellous new colleagues. He ended up calling Mr Hamilton two-faced and a silly beggar. Anthony Beaumont Dark sprang to his feet. Wasn't this unparliamentary language? Are you allowed to call members two-faced? Yeah. No. Without saying which face you're talking to, yeah. because it's absolutely outrageous Straight to talk off. like that. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. appalling. I, I, I'd rather not hear such expressions in this house, but I have no authority at this stage to ask the Honourable Member for Ashfield to withdraw. Summing up for the government, the coal minister Michael Spicer dismissed opposition warnings. What we are doing today is putting British coal on its feet lean and hungry for business, not fattening it up. Once it has been placed on a proper financial footing, it will be able and indeed to, required to do so to uh, operate without taxpayer support in the future. The bill was given a second reading by a majority of 88. 
In a late debate, the government announced that it'll publish its plans today to neutralise acid house parties. At question time, Mrs Thatcher will no doubt be taunted by Labour over today's vote on the Tory leadership. But for now, that's all from me, Cathy. Sean, thank you very much indeed. Well, coming up, Lizzie will be working out with the help of a few young friends after this break. When you've got a chesty cough, but don't want a medicine that slows you down or makes you sleepy, there's an effective remedy that lets you keep going. Nyrolex expectorant made by Boots. That's better. When you're feeling out of order, turn to Boots Medicines. At Christmas, it's often those personal gifts that mean the most. The ones that say, I love you. Like the classic fragrances from Monterey. Style Parfum de Toile. The elegant and romantic perfume. Tweed. The timeless classic. And Fashion Perfume Spray. A vibrant fragrance full of French flair. Classic gifts by Monterey. We've got Christmas wrapped up. In the world of hair fashion, Babyliss makes the tools of the trade. Designing products which inspire hairdressers to produce their most beautiful effects. Now there's a complete range of Babyliss professional hair appliances for you. The Babyliss professional range, exclusively at Boots. Designed to inspire you. 